Next edition, Julia is going to make a workshop on Julia. Yeah, she's going to do that. I know we had the winners yesterday, Chewbacca. Wha wha what's your real name? I mean, that was there. <laughs> you got 11,000 points. And uh, we, we got Daniel as well, Daniel Delph. You got 12,000 12, points. And we, we were wondering if that could be uh, a ranking for the next organizer of the open source cubes at workshop. So they, they, they've been therefore selected to be those organizers. <laughs> But we'll see, they have to discuss with the Both Space Foundation because they're, they're going to organize the next edition. So I hope uh, we had no casualties yesterday. Who's uh, okay with the legs? Who has some legs, aches, you know, because of laser attack? A little bit? Yeah. Good. So we have, uh, we have a nice session coming uh, <coughs> this morning. But before that, uh, I have a little word to say. So... Some of us are coming from very far, like uh, Nihon, Nihon, Japan, India, cool. Argentina, I mean it's a 14 hour uh, flight and a 20 hour journey, so it's quite a, it's quite a trip. And, uh, and we, we've learned yesterday that uh, the, uh, the Club of Robotics, uh, the uh, Argentinian team here today, are going to speak today. Uh, they got the benediction of the Science and Technology Minister. So before coming here, the quatches of the stage, they went on TV, they went on radio, and they said, yeah, go to OSCW, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that's Fantastic. amazing. So it's cool. So yesterday I checked, we, we got five, uh, 512 people on the live stream. So, uh, so yeah, we mean it. So when you ask your question, use the microphone. They are here, they are listening. Uh, I think we have a lot of people on site who, who are trying to, trying to work. But uh, yeah, but it's better to listen to what's happening here. And, uh, and I just wanted to show you a little thing because uh, discussing with you yesterday, uh, I mean, you all had these great ideas, the after effect of the workshop. So, so here you create connections, so try to keep them connected and keep connecting, c uh, creating connections. That's your network and that's the how the CubeSat community can grow. And also, we were talking about making, uh, uh, first I heard, uh, maybe we'll we need an open, open bookmark because we share many links uh, among ourselves and uh, maybe we miss some of the information and we're like, ah, this uh, Astro Lab thing, or where is it? I've seen that on Twitter. I, I put it quickly on this link. This is a GitLab of uh, Libos Space Foundation and we, we had this, uh, this project open there. And uh, and uh, so please feel free to check it out and uh, and connect. We'll discuss with uh, with Pieros how we can uh, uh, create this collaboration and have an open book and a, a wiki, so we can we can also summarize what happened in the workgroups. So with no further ado, uh, we'll start the sessions today. And uh, your chair of this morning is going to be the amazing, <laughs> the amazing Ivan Aksenov. Thank you. Thank you very much, Red. Good morning. My name is still Ivan Aksanov. Nothing changed since yesterday, which is good. Did you have a good time last night? More importantly, yesterday, did you learn something? I had a great time last night. I really did. The dinner. Actually, uh, the laser tag, I bailed out a little bit. I just drank at the bar. It was quite good, though. Things were good. But what I didn't realize was that my phone was ringing because I had it on silent for the whole day, as you can imagine, conference, keep it on silent. But then my wife was trying to con contact me last night. So I had a great time, had a few drinks, and I finally got home, but she <laughs> was not happy. No. And we had that discussion, and she said, Ivan, really, this is not gonna, gonna work. You can't continue like this. We feel, your family feel, as if we have been excluded. And I tried to explain, no, of course, it's not true. I, I, I really am a family man. But she said no. And then it got heated, and she used the P word. She said, Ivan, you're so proprietary lately. <laughs> I said, no. I mean, you know how I feel about open. 
And I thought I was being open everywhere, but clearly for my family, I was just a black box. They could not really see inside, see what's happening within me. So we discussed it for a great length of time, and finally we made a decision. And that is that I include my wife and family in my daily things. In particular, I thought the easiest thing I said, Anka, what I can do is invite you to riot. Now, riot is one of these tools that you can actually, it's like uh, Slack, only it's open source. So I have invited my wife to Slack, and now every time that I publish on GitHub, she gets a link, and she's happy. And I thought to myself, maybe this could be something for our new family, you guys. Our family here is starting to form. And yet we're very distributed, yeah? We are all over the world. And yet when we go home, we want to stay in connection. So maybe we could use something like Riot to keep in contact, remember each other's birthdays, and things like this. Anyway, I just thought I'd start with that. Today we have some wonderful speakers, and we're going to continue on this verification point. And I like to start with Hannes Zona. And Hannes has been uh, very interested in lasers ever since playing with the cat. But since he's uh, now a PhD student at the Electrical Engineering Space Electronics University of Applied Science, Jena, which is in cooperation with the Technical University of Berlin, he is going to show us how you can set up cosmic rays on the bench. And I think this is going to be a real lot of fun. So a warm welcome for Hannes Zolder. Thank you for a nice introduction. Where did you find the real story? <laughs> Where did you find it? So the official story I will tell you now, but OK, you already know the truth. Um, yeah, I'm presenting you a laser setup for generating signal event effects in um, yeah, cold sparks. Um, yeah, it's just the continuing of playing laser tech from yesterday. I do the same the whole day. That's why I'm also bad last night. Um, what's the problem about? So the pointer is not working. Um, let's just fix that. Um, I think some of you know about this problem. Electronic parts just work with smoke. When it disappears, they are gone. Um, how can this happen in space? So I will give you an introduction into space radiation stuff. I think many of you um, are not so deep inside this problem. So let's go a bit deeper into the silicon. Opening the chips was already done. So um, here we can see um, standard CMOS technology stuff. Um, mostly field effect transistors, but parasitic. You have um, bipolar structures who are a bit deeper into um, schematics and electronics. You can see this is a thyristor. It's a structure, if you once ignite it, the current will continue flowing. Normally on ground, there's no problem, but in space, you have the cosmic uh, radiation. Those are high energy particles going through space and sometimes go through the electronics, go through the silicon, and on their path, they are generating electron hole pairs and when this particle hits the gate of the um, thyristor it might be ignited and you have a continuously current flowing from power supply to ground or IO pins or whatever that's called a short circuit if you don't do anything against this the part will die and maybe the satellite is gone so of course there are space parts that are designed that this can't happen. But as we are dealing with um, CubeSats, often commercial off the shelf parts are used and they are not designed to work in space where this effect can happen. So, this as an introduction. Um, to generate those effects on ground, normally you need a particle accelerator. 
Yeah, I currently don't have one on my place. We have one in Jena at the university. It's a quite large facility, but the energies are mm, could maybe sufficient to generate some effects. But the problem with those accelerators, maybe uh, some of you know, um, yeah, special facilities. You need long time to plan to get get the date where you can do your investigations there. You have to go there, so it's quite time consuming. Of course, expensive. Yeah, and mostly in vacuum, so it's quite a lot of work to do. Um, while getting into the radiation stuff, I read lots of literature and found out that it's also possible to generate those effects with pulse lasers. In this case, you don't use charged particles. You can use a laser pulse on a very small area with a yeah, some defined energy. And the photons, each photon is generating an electron hole pair on a small spot. So it's mainly the same effect. And then I also read that it should be possible with diode lasers but didn't find anything how much energy you actually need. So, and of course I'm an electrical engineer. I came to the idea, yeah, I have this device lying around. Maybe all of you know, a DVD writer, it has a laser inside, can make you know, small dots in a disc, really small micrometer range, and it's writing quite fast, so it can do short pulses. And yeah, I peeled it off. Inside you have an optical unit, a focusing lens. So I just took the optical part, replaced the electronics, and the result is this first prototype. Here you can see the original optical unit. That's the original PCB, I just use it as an adapter. Of course, the controlling I had to place into the original housing. Um, there you can control all the, the laser stuff. There's a small pulse generator inside. So on one side an oscillator, or you can do a single pulse. Some electronics to, to form a pulse. If you are interested in the schematics, uh, I have a poster there, there it's painted. So, and you just can adjust uh, the pulse width, and then I'm using the, the optical unit, so you can adjust the intensity and the focus on the chip. And then you have a microcontroller, those are those parts here, um, put it under it, focus onto the surface and pull some pulses in or mainly just one if you have if you found the area where you can hit the part and see reactions and with this setup you can yeah generate mainly um, cosmic radiation on your desk and yeah one thing is the photons uh, can't pass the, the the housing of the chip, so I have to play in the chemical laboratory. On top left, you see the first experiments trying to decapsulate the chips. It's quite hard. <laughs> um, you need um, nitric acid or sulfuric acid on 100 to 200 degrees. So what could possibly go wrong if you make something wrong with your hands or whatever? So I did quite a lot of experiments opening this and finally the current state is this. Just the chip is open, the rest of the PCB is fine. It's still functional. And yeah, what can we do with the setup? So as I said, you can generate latch ups. Why should we do this? 
Latch ups can happen on satellites if you use COTS components. Not very often, but yeah, I heard of some small satellites. Yeah, they failed after some years. We don't know exactly why. It just was off. Maybe it was a latch up. Because, yeah, then it's just gone and you don't see anything. So that's why what I will do the next time, continue the development of protection mechanisms. There are also s already some available. Um, but I didn't find any real value on how fast you have to react. After a latch up is ignited, how fast do you have to switch it off? There are different values to be found in publications, but it seems nobody investigated this further. So I will play on this field. The other thing I didn't talk about yet is the generation of bit flips. It's also possible. Um, it's roughly the same effect, but without the thyristor. A memory cell is just some yeah, some um, energy is stored in a certain area and when a particle passes, it might change the value and you have a bit flip. And what I think about is to use this setup for testing software. So you just can use your maybe final flight software, use it on real hardware. You don't have to implement some test functions just put it there, leave it running, put it under the laser, go through the surface and generate bit flips and check what the software thinks about it. Another thing is testing test equipment. If you want to go to a particle accelerator, as I said, yeah, complicated. So with this, you can just do pre-tests Take your chip, put it under the laser, and test your testing equipment. Yeah, and as it's standing on your desk, you just can play around the whole day and night, as I do, and see what you can do with your chips. Yeah, mainly that's about it. And if you are able, you can ask questions. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions to start off with? Yes. Hi. Uh, what kind of uh, particle energies did you uh, did you get for these uh, SEs? Um, yeah, with laser, it's a bit different. Um, so it's it's a wide range. Um, there are some publications that show a correlation between the laser energy and a particle energy. Um, but you always have to calibrate it by reference measurements. So you have to take your part into an accelerator, throw particles with a known energy on it, and then you can do the same thing with your laser setup and adjust the parameters that you have those values. Um, but the problem is, that with this wavelength I'm using, it's visible light. The I use the DVD part, not the CD part. The CD part is near infrared. Um, just that I can see what is happening. It's not so dangerous. Um, <coughs> so the, the limitation is the penetration depth. So with this wavelength, you get into the silicon around 10 micrometers. So you can just use front side illumination. Another way is backside illumination, but yeah, there you have the whole die, and it's much wider than time micrometers. So you have to go there on top, and there you have the metallization layers. So we actually never know how much energy really gets into the silicon. So the setup won't be usable for doing a comparison between the, the energies itself. So. Okay. And uh, I have a question myself. So I find it so cool because uh, I we're working on anomaly detection. 
and uh, uh, and this means we could maybe test and go to the to the real cause of this. But we are doing machine learning, and we need data. And this thing is like everybody could maybe test on their on their desktop, and they have sensors. They can maybe uh, uh, save the the time series of uh, all the currents uh, on each of the pins, those kind of things, generate data, and we can learn from this. So. Uh, are you planning to make a wiki on a how-to or like a, a hack your DVD reader or writer and then uh, it we can it's do it? It's planned. So yeah, cool. I'm currently yeah, more or less quite on the beginning. Okay. I'm already working on this three years. Okay. Um, so the basic thing is working and yeah, I plan to make okay. it open source. And then keep, keep in touch because uh, I want to uh, help okay. you with the community. Please. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question at the back. Um, I don't know so much about uh, laser protection, but I think it's dangerous to play around with a laser. Um, or open laser. So, do you need uh, any glasses or? Good point. Kind of yes, actually, you, you don't need. Um, the laser itself—it's a class three B laser. It's quite dangerous. Two hundred fifty milliwatts. But I'm just using pulses of maximum 20 nanoseconds. It's quite short. And if I have the, the oscillator mode, I have a repetition rate of maximum one kilohertz. So they are far out of another. And I calculated it through. So the single pulse energy as well as the average energy is in class one. And I also have a um, protection inside. I think it's also on the poster. A quite simple high pass filter in series of the laser diode. So when something fails with the electronics, if it wants to switch on the, the, the laser diode continuously, it just goes off. And so you are completely safe. So it's boring. <laughs> so he here was another question. Yep. Hey, very nice uh, question. You said you have quite little penetration in the IC. Uh, power is not very high. Do you already have some results on some ICs? Which ICs can you try or which things could be tested with your uh, setup? Um, so the, the most uh, investigated part up to now is the MSP430 microcontroller of TI. There's really good possible to uh, inject all those effects, bit flips and latch ups. Um, we tried with uh, Atmega from Atmel or now microchip. Um, the investigation is not yet completely finished, so I've used shorter pulses, and there we didn't see any effect. So it's, it's a thing of structure sizes. So the Atmega has a quite large structure size, um, and there you need more energy to throw in that you see something. I think that's uh, the point. And the other thing, it was the K21 from NXP. Um, this one has lots of metallization on top. So we couldn't generate any bit flips. Also to be confirmed, we didn't have a test software checking all areas. Um, but the most of the memory is covered. But latch ups generation is quite well possible because it has quite small feature sizes. Any further questions? Yeah. Yep. So first, thank you for this really uh, interesting and in inspiring uh, project. Um, my question that I have is because uh, maybe I'm too lame for understand this, and uh, maybe you can't answer it, but maybe some odd, uh, uh, software engineers here in this room can answer it. So here's my question. If I'm now going to test my flight software on that chip, and I test it with in inside of your setup, and I create latch ups and I see my software is uh, now not working anymore. Are there effectively mechanism, software technically speaking, which wi uh, with which is possible to 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 get rid of this uh, uh, or to find pos um, ways to 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 recover from latch ups? Um, or is it just as oh, I up. have a ledge up, my software is, is dying, but I can't do anything. I, from software, you can't do anything because it's a hardware effect. Um, you have to switch off the power, 
wait some time and switch it on, and then it's fine. So it's just randomly testing something with an outcome you know. After a while, your software is dead. Point. Period. Um, so it's also a question of intensity of the laser. I didn't do any uh, deeper um, investigations by this. Mm -hmm. um, but what I think that you need less energy for a bit flip than for a latch up to be confirmed. So um, maybe you can adjust the intensity lower that you can't ignite a latch up. So it's all about, it's all about uh, you have to re try to recover it from a, a hardware point uh, of view. Yes. You never can recover from software point of view. You somehow yeah. have to switch it off. I don't know if anyone want to answer this, because uh, I know there are some mechanisms. So. Well, it depends. On, uh, to answer your question, it depends on um, where the problem is happening. Um, there are several things that can happen when you have a ledge up or a bit flip or something like this. For example, if you have a bit flip it can have no effect at all because this part of the um, memory isn't used right now. But it also can, uh, um, um, uh, can, can stop your software. Or um, the, the most easiest, the easiest error to, to solve is your, your, your uh, microcontroller will stop working. And then you have some um, thing called a watchdog. Yeah. You, you you have a watchdog. You have some 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 part of the microcontroller which uh, um, um, needs to be updated once in a while, and if not if it's not updated, it reboots the whole system, restarts the whole system. That's 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 one of the easi easiest thing things. What also can happen is that um, you have a bit flip in a part, say in the um, uh, satellite control system. You have a bit flip there, but you don't realize that there is a bit flip. Your, your software is still running, but it tells the uh, uh, some, some uh, one of the reaction control system uh, thrusters to uh, switch on full power. So you will lo you will lose your satellite because of this bit flip. Yeah, it will start spinning. It will will uh, uh, spin. Will have no connection to the ground station anymore, and such things can happen. And the only thing to uh, do here is to have some kind of hemming code or some kind of checksum of your of what you write in your memory, so you can realize this is a mathematical. Um, uh, um, uh, um Yes, CRC exactly. Yes, it's a, it's a exactly yes. Okay, CRC. I'd like to uh, just bring it back to the stage. Yes, you, 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 yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yes, you for for the stream, you um, uh, um, check what's in the memory with a checksum, and then you know if what you you've written in the memory and what you write back is okay. uh, what you really want. Right, have one more question, please, and then we'll wind up. This is a comment to the last discussion. Uh, look into the Herschel problem. This is exactly what it was. You know, there, was a l there was a single event upset, and the pr it turns out that there was no checksum in software. So they, uh, th they were actually correcting both hardware and software. Good. Thank you very, very much. I would like to thank, help me thank, <laughs> Hannes Zona. Thank you, Hannes. So what was very, very interesting, I think, was be able to be just thinking outside the box and looking at what equipment you have at home and trying to actually be very ingenuitive and being able to use those tools. I really enjoyed that out of that last talk. And then the next talk is going to be also very creative. We have our next group from Argentina, as you've heard this morning, and I would like to invite Hernan Paez and... Uh, sorry, I can't think. And <laughs> I'm sorry, SQL Molina. Please come up to the stage. My apologies for not getting the second name quickly enough. And thank you. And welcome, welcome to the stage. And what I found very, very interesting was what this creative club from Argentina, the robotics club from Argentina, are doing with 3D printing and with commercial off-the-soft software to be able to use that technology 
for future generations. And that's what I find very interesting. How can this technology be used for the future education of our children? Over to you guys. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm Arnold Paez. I'm here with Ezequiel and Marco Albert Reina. We are from Córdoba, Argentina. Uh, 20 hours from here. <laughs> it's a long trip. <laughs> we are a member of a uh, rot uh, robotic club, uh, our university, Universidad Tecnológica Nacional, a group to share um, a common interest to open related to open source application. I'm now embarking in the airspace field. The club is open to everybody. For example, uh, engineering students like us, professionals, and even artists. Because our limit funds, we need to take advantage of all our resources, since the project are self financed a few months ago, Marco invited us to venture in aerospace technology and develop an academic satellite platform. That was so inter interesting for us. And okay, we said yes immediately because in our region, the technology technological resources are expensive and the training at airspace developments is not easy to reach. With the support of UTN and CONAE, now we are working on this academic satellite platform based on CubeSat standard 3D printing by fusion deposition modeling and commercial of the shelf. Our, our goal for the near future is to set a working academic CubeSat model with a Wi-Fi wi based ground station that can simulate a whole space mission to train undergraduate and professional in aerospace environment because the application environment of our proposal, this is a project more related to people than technology. But okay, regarding to the technologies, we are following the Kaoshita Ogata philosophy. So I would like to quote his words. A functional complex system is the natural evolution of a functional simple system. And on that way, we divide the evolution of this project in two steps. As you can see, the evolution one has four phases. Conceptual design, detailed design, assembly, integration, and test. Well, an operation and application. The first phase if this is of this project is the conceptual design of the wall space system. So the idea is to make a satellite platform based on a tailored CubeSat standard with 3D printed structure and commercial of the self electronic. All of this for educational purpose following the guidelines of open source community. The second phase is the detailed design. We are studying the CubeSat standard version 13 to be able to tailor it to our project. The 3D model selection uh, was based in three open source CubeSat projects for control, attitude, position, 
communication and also the payload electronics, we choose uh, Arduino modules. The selection criteria is intercompatibility, prices, and regional availability. Well, talking about this, uh, we found and bought the solar panel here in Frankfurt. <laughs> um, the assembly integration and test phase is ongoing. Even the previous phases are not finished. We already selected and printed the mechanical structure and select and bought the electronics. The next step was testing each part separately, checking connectivity and a basic firmware for each one. The result The result of the, uh, of the integration process should be a cheaper academic cubes system than offered for the proposed in the market. A smart salt, SAT platform is around $10,000. The aim of the, the project in this way is that the students should be able to integrate their own satellites. The fourth phase uh, consists in operation and application. Well, where is the fourth phase? Oh, okay. <laughs> the fourth phase uh, consists of operation and application that include development of operation abilities of the platform, generation of plans and procedures, develop of application based on available subsystem software. We don't get there yet. Well, uh, I will give the word to my partner, Ezequiel. So, thanks, Alman. Uh, the, the first phase is complete, and the second phase is half done. I'll have done. And the third phase is a quarter done. So, uh, previous work, uh, UNICEF Global Debris Mitigation Competition, the Robotic Club, under the support of the US East, is currently at the signal stage of this contest with the project. Safe deployment the orbit system by solenoid for micro satellites. From 2010, the Robotic Club is working on many academic projects related to educational robotic application. What is next? Oh. Our goal for this step, smart to component and standardization, technological and or scientific purpose, onboard GPAs for training in relative navigation, Material study and test for 3D printing, EI and T, gram station, software and communication, and why not? This is Tronador 2. Uh, finally, special thanks to Science and Technology Ministerium of Argentina, to the economical support. UTN, CONAE, and Open Source CubeSat Workshop for invite us and the organization. Thanks. <laughs> now, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, I'd like to invite here. Marco to come up. Marco Reina, please make him feel welcome. He's also part of the team. Hi, everybody. Please come over here into the center yeah. so that the camera okay. is <laughs> So Marco is going to be <laughs> helping time. with the Q&A part. Are yes. there any questions to start off with? Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Um, you said you 3D printed.
printed it and this is plastic. Yes. So did you make uh, temperature measurements? What happens if it's in space, if it's get warm, it's get cold, if it cracks or something? Nice and what was your experience with it? <laughs> okay, nice questions. Um, I have a question too regarding to vibration tests. Okay, um, it's good to exp explain that our project I will not fly. That's an academic um, project to train st students. It's a kit to, to say, okay. okay, in this stage, these four phases are to design a kit to train students, uh, to, to train undergraduate students. The second evolution of our project could be a satellite. Then we will uh, think on Okay, vibration test, thermal test, another theory of tests. Uh, but for these uh, phases, uh, we are so the okay co coming into the aerospace field. Then, okay, we don't think now to to do some tests. Thank you. I think that's a wonderful uh, idea to yes. think about how to share space and mm -hmm. new new space in particular to uh, teenagers. I think that's really very, very commendable. Yes, yes. Any other questions? Yes, we have a question over here. Pablo, thank you. Daniel, Shuffle Space System check. Uh, if I want to 3D print it, where could I download the model? You can do download uh, everything in, in Thinkiverse, for example. Or any repository. Or NASA have the three three models of the are the frames. Yes. We we reuse three uh, D models, open open three D models, and we adapt them for our technologies for our printers. Um, in, in the future, we will uh, share uh, our designs. Uh, the whole project is open. Then we will do some repository for, for sharing documentation and the 3D models. Good. I think we look forward to that. Any other questions? Yes, question. Um, have you ever checked the uh, um, ah, my name is Shinji Kimura from to Japan. And have you ever checked uh, um, the ASAT project of Japan? No. Oh, I think uh, um, they utilize the ASAT and uh, uh, 3D printing material on launched by the um, uh, okay, H2A, well. isn't it? H2A? Rocket, what? they are already launched and uh, check it. Uh, check the performance of that. So uh, uh, I nice. recommend you to check that. Uh, that Wonderful. That Thank, you. Thank you. So maybe you can share share that information later. Very good. Very good. Further questions? <coughs> then I would like to help me welcome and thank for their work. Thank you very very much, guys. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Thank you all. you guys. <coughs> I'd like to make a note. I'd like to make a note that there has been a change to our lineup for the next speaker. Unfortunately, Florian Schumer, I'm sure he's watching, he's not very well this week. And as we say here, gute Besserung. But the good news is, that we have Katia Janser, the technical uni from Munich. She's the leader of the move to a thermal subsystem engineer and part of the project since the very beginning. And in such cases, she's the acting systems engineer. The talk is going to be about requirements. And I want you to think about why is it not enough to have a huge list of requirements. Why is this not enough? You have the huge list of requirements. Is that the end of the story? Perhaps not. Let's welcome Katya to hear more about her approach, her new approach. Katya, please make a welcome. Katya, welcome to the stage. Hi, so actually I'm not the lead of the Move2 team, but only the lead of the subsystem, the thermal subsystem. Um, Florian Schumer is sick, so I kind of jumped into here and 
gonna present it. So if you have any specific questions, I try my best to um, answer them, but probably you can just write Flo a mail. Okay, so um, Alex talked yesterday about the move to CubeSat at the Technical University of Munich. You probably already forgot most of it because we had quite some talks yesterday. So just gonna refresh your memory. So move to a CubeSat project at um, the Technical University of Munich. We are funded by the DLR and the kickoff was in April 2015. It's a one unit CubeSat with um, new solar cells as payload and we're gonna launch it in the beginning of next year in a sun synchronous orbit. So we have commercial off the shelf parts in move two, which are basically the onboard data handling system and the EPS system with the battery and a lot of in-house developed um, systems like the ADCS system, the COM transceivers, um, the whole measurement circuitry for the payload board and structure, the open me mechanism based on a shape memory alloy spring and the software Alex talked yesterday about it. Move to organized with 10 subsystems. Every subsystem has a team leader. At peak times, we were approximately 100 students. And since uh, March 2016, we had a dedicated subsystems engineering team, <coughs> which doesn't every CubeSat team have. So nice to know, know that. Those are pictures from my team members. Um, we are lucky at the Technical University of Munich to have good facilities like a clean room. You can see here on the top left corner. Oh, yeah. We also have a thermal vacuum chamber, which we can use basically almost every any time we want to use it. So you can see here the engineering model in the um, thermal vacuum chamber. And he also installed the engineering model in the thermal vacuum chamber. And now a little bit about the project manage uh, management at Move2. We use Redmine as a, um, well, project management tool. We have tickets. We create tickets for every task and bug and assign it to a correspondent person who has to do that task. We have also a time tracking um, system. So every team member has to track his time. He's working on the project. Otherwise the whole thing will go haywire and nobody will do anything and just continue existing in the team and not contributing to the whole project. And we have the um, Slack as communication tool. Also you can see current numbers from two days ago. Just nice to know how much time we spent there, how much tickets we have. But why am I here? Not to talk about Move2, but to talk about requirements at Move2. So requirements usually in the, like, let's call it old space, a fancy name, um, projects usually have a long development time. You have humongous amounts of requirements, which are defined and finalized early in the whole project. So if you want to change a requirements afterwards during the development time, the designing phase, it will take quite a lot of time to change it and it will be expensive. Now we have a lot of negative aspects, but you also have one positive aspect. It's easy to find the scapes code. So you will find someone or at least one requirement which couldn't be met. So if your system doesn't work, you will just say, well, this person or this requirement wasn't met. It's not my fault that the whole system doesn't work. It doesn't really create a nice atmosphere to work on a project, especially not on a CubeSat. Um, so how should the requirements be made during like a CubeSat project or for a CubeSat project? The best thing would be flexible requirements. So you in the initial phase, you just set some requirements, then the you test your system, <coughs> see them usually fail because they just m met some imaginary requirement nobody really knows where it comes from and then you just have to adjust your requirement. <coughs> there are a few requirements which have to be met which are the money aspect, the time aspect, so you have a certain amount of money not more. You have your launching date until then you have to be finished. The technology and performance, so 
If you want to build a CubeSat, you have to build a CubeSat. That's a requirement. You can't just change randomly to let's build something else. So you can change the requirements during the process, but you need to freeze them at some point. The best point would be a CDR. So this process creates more freedom for the developer and you have a better atmosphere just to work. You can be more creative. Truth be told, it sounds a bit chaotic. So you can change the requirements all the time until some random point you say, okay, we we'll just stop it, we freeze them and it's like this. So how do we do this? <coughs> we visualize the whole requirement thing. So um, vis visualization helps you to maintain um, and make changes in requirements easier. So you can um, focus more on the important aspects. Now, how what we what do we do at Move2? We have a tool chain. We use Git as a um, version control. It makes faster for reviewing um, new versions and you have the complete history of all the requirements you ever had. Also, common separated values file because it's a simple format. You can just edit it with any spreadsheet program and we use, that's the um, important aspect here, Giphy. We use it for the visualization. You can trace requirements. We uh, can analyze the impact of one requirement in regards to other requirements and um, you can verify new versions. So the preparation, you analyze the stakeholder, who, who needs this requirement. If nobody needs the requirement, it's complete obsolete. You just don't need it. You check the, the phrasing so everybody, so it's clear everybody understands what's meant with the, this requirement. And the you check the rationales. So a short description of why we have this requirement <coughs> and what yeah, so I mean, you have the check the phrasing, it's clear, and a short description, so it's foolproof. <coughs> then you trace the requirements and go to Giphy. You update the visual model and you verify the relations, the benefits. You can derive performance values, assess um, change of requirements, and diffuse unnecessary requirements. Now, an example from Move2. <coughs> derived performance values. We started with a pointing accuracy of our ADCS system of five degrees. Then during the CDR, so nothing was frozen at the CDR, but during the CDR we decided, mm, no, we don't want to do Nadi pointing, instead we will do sun pointing. Why? Because it's more convenient for our mission. Why we had Nadi pointing, nobody really knows why. It was just defined at some random point in the beginning. So we changed the requirement from five degree cell, uh, Celsius, that's my um, thermal background coming here. Five degree um, pointing accuracy to plus minus 45 pointing yeah, accuracy. And here will we, um, I will show you a short example of the um, Giphy visualization tool from Move2. <coughs> that's what we started with. During our two unit phase, so I didn't mention that before, but we started with a two unit CubeSat until the funding came from the GLR and said, no, you have mine just for one unit. So we built one unit. The next iteration, the iteration after that, the last iteration. Now in comparison, we started with the one on the left and finished with the one on the right. You can see on the right you have clusters of, a, of requirements impacting other requirements, like here or here. So you can see the um, dependencies between those requirements quite well. And those purple dots are um, the requirements which were impacted by the decision of the DLR to make a one unit CubeSat, not a two unit CubeSat. Not as many as expected. In summary, we um, had 60 requirements rephrased or deactivated, 75 were added, 46 resulted from a better understanding of the whole system, and the number of requirements went up by one third. It took uh, in total four iterations to have all the necessary requirements, um, all the necessary traces made. And um, if you want to change a requirement, just or see what impact a change in requirements would take, it takes about 30 minutes. And that's about it. Questions? <laughs> Wonderful. Do we have any questions? 
Then I have a question, uh, Katya, um, about scalability. Can you tell me how, how this can be perhaps scaled? So, um, GIFI, we used GIFI, it's um, quite handy if you have, s it's a smaller project, but if you have like a big project, GIFI can handle it, but I don't know if you can handle this whole <laughs> weird <laughs> system, so, uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you, it's very good visual. <laughs> Any other questions, please? Question over here? Yeah, we have to get the microphone. I have coming. another. Uh, One over here, first, Pablo. Thanks, Helga. Um, do you have an example of your uh, CSV files? I do not have it, but Flo Schummer has it for sure. <laughs> so if his mail is um, written here, you can just write him. Okay, I, I would like to add a comment on that because tracking requirements is, um, I think, not a solved problem because uh, in the industry you use doors or uh, something like that and um, this is of course not uh, feasible for CubeSat projects so having a um, maybe having a common standard for tracking requirements wouldn't be that bad so um, are, you, are you willing to share that? I wouldn't see a problem why not but still you uh, I don't have it so if you write him a mail he for sure will answer. So everybody bug blow about this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he it's will be really happy. Uh, did you have a question, Pablo? Yeah, just okay. <coughs> just while we're waiting for the question to come, I just have to say that it's just wonderful to see this visualization of requirements. This is what I haven't seen in a ma management requirements management tool. Yeah, Any actually, question? my question was going to go mm. towards that okay. and the visualization aspect, and maybe uh, your experience with this so far. What, what if any patterns do you see revealed? Because I think what's perhaps the most interesting thing about this is if there are systematic aspects related to the requirements and I guess the visualizations are maybe shedding light on you know specific things that are deeper than you know a specific design or a specific subsystem so have you had the opportunity to look let's say an abstract mm. from the visualization something that is a deeper meaning to you know the way these systems are kind of architected uh well here again I have to reference Flo Schumann because <laughs> I didn't do the um whole requirement part it was him and a colleague of mine who is at the university so if you write him a mail he can answer you again <laughs> yeah so i would have another question maybe also for the audience uh, because this goes uh, well into this domain of um, model-based system engineering that's where you basically keep track of your uh, we have you have a central repository that holds all your design information of your system, also including the requirements. So whenever you do an update of the requirements, that the entire the, the model is instantly um, uh, is represented. Not like with printout requirements, where you have, uh, if you change one document, uh, you might forget to update the other document, and <coughs> this gets all mixed up. Uh, so have you looked, or is there some experience with uh, from you guys uh, how you handle the requirements, or are you handling requirements <laughs> at all? <laughs> Question to the audience. <laughs> Anyone have an answer? Because, for example, in the ECSS domain, there's, uh, there's quite some documents about how to handle requirements, how to formulate them, how to verify them. We're losing the requirements, it's free. Mm. <laughs> Hi, uh, so... Yeah, hi, uh, query from here. Yeah. Um, this is a pretty amazing tool. So um, uh, just just one query, uh, is does this also like tie in to uh, timeline uh, requirements and uh, you know, project management sort of uh, requirements also? I'm not so sure about that. I know that they put all the requirements they had into mm. this and the time aspect, I think it's kind of difficult to put it in there but I, d I don't really know it. Mm. So, okay. yeah, I mean, you have a time aspect, but at some point, um, in our case, it's like this. We should have um, like finished the move two months ago, but IDIS keeps um, delaying the, uh, well, shipping the satellite because of the rocket. So, but how you can tie in the whole time aspect in GIFI, I'm not so sure about that. Okay. 
I have a question about this visualization. Clearly, it, it points out any orphaned requirements. So everything really should be linked. You know, that's my understanding. And this one, I think, would be very interesting to actually see that there has been a mention, but no link to a subsystem or to something that is actually related to the stakeholder's uh, request. So this orphaning of requirements, I think, uh, is, is very obvious with the, the visualization. Very impressed. Another question? Um, one, one thing related to your example, which was very interesting. Um, there are, I, I guess the first thing we do with requirements is look for a previous mission similar to ours, take their requirements and then throw away the obvious ones. But often there are requirements we forget, like why were we doing nadir pointing and not sun pointing? And perhaps the um, one area where open source can help is to understand for various types of missions what are the, shall we say, the first cut of requirements that you need to define that you could foresee mm. freezing at the CDR stage, so the driving level requirements, and have a kind of yeah. uh, toolkit of requirements that could be used to source different types of CubeSat missions. Yeah. So I just wanted to add a word, so I'm part of the, um, the data analytics team for operation. <laughs> and so we did this tiny bit of machine learning uh, mm -hmm. for subsystem behavior prediction. The thing is that we went through gathering a lot of data around and it was quite a pain. And, um, and we figured out that the more we have, the better we can do, uh, the more things we can do actually. And uh, getting those requirements in the loop, actually we have a, a graph visualization as well uh, to see the dependency between the telemetry. But getting the requirements uh, with the telemetry data and everything, mm -hmm. we, can, we can do things like for instance, we have one spectra uh, operation engineer who came to us saying, I have two temperatures, they're inverted. Usually one is on top of the other. And she didn't know why. And she was uh, worried that this could be a real trouble. The thing is that a month ago, they decided to switch star trackers. It took seven months to switch temperatures. But then they didn't get, they didn't get the alert until the, those seven months. So it's very hard to make a link with this seven month event mm. uh, in time. So having this, uh, this knowledge base of your mission, including requirements, that if you switch star tracker, you will impact temperature of electronics and then those telemetries and et cetera, is something we're trying to build. So, and this is tough. Nevertheless, uh, we have, a, we have a, a graph visualization. I'm talking a lot, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, we're thinking of uh, open sourcing it. Uh, behind the data, we don't have. We're trying to get off the static file and go to a graph database, and uh, and then have dynamic information so we can navigate through the data. So we're using that at the moment for telemetry dependency analysis, but it's also for for more administrative tasks or like uh, Ioannis uh, is watching his uh, thermal network, so we can check patterns and uh, see if something is wrong. So I think it's a, it's a re really good point, but uh, we, can, we can maybe have the bigger picture of what, what's the impact of all this. Okay. So and I'm uh, happy to stay in touch okay. for this. Then I, is there one more question? Yep. <coughs> okay, um, it's a feeling uh, I'm a bit wondering with a very, very high number of requirements, but actually you, maybe I missed it, you didn't say how many requirements there are. So I'm not judging, I'm just uh, wondering, uh, is the number of requirements really top-down? Requi are the requirements really top-down? I mean, do you exactly create a requirement only once uh, you know from where it comes, wh where it comes from? Uh, maybe the risk in this, uh, in your approach is that you have not only requirements, you have questions, uh, bottom-up questions, questions from the team that uh, somebody wants to make it as a requirement because he doesn't know uh, what is the maximum temperature, so he asks his supervisor, uh, well, uh, I'm blocked there, I'd like uh, you to specify to me uh, what should be the maximum temperature, so I make a requirement, but it's not actually. Mm -hmm. So maybe the requirement uh, are artificially <laughs> created because there is a, 
um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's, it comes from uh, a, a behavior uh, that comes from the dialogue with Diera, for instance, who who is familiar with making uh, ha many many requirements. Maybe it comes from the teams who create so who create artificial requirements. Anyway, in our projects, we are more familiar with hundred, two hundred, maybe three hundred requirements, but not thousands. So. Why yeah. wha what do you think about uh, requirements generation? <laughs> well, I don't think we have thousands of requirements. I do not know the exact number, actually. Um, but artificial requirements... I, I'm not so sure if we have any artificial requirements. I mean, at some point they were made, yes. I wasn't part of the making process of requirements. I can just say the thermal team had the requirement to not get too hot or too cold, stay in between the operational temperature limits. So that was our requirement, which was quite, well, flexible, I'd say. I mean, so yeah, we had no hard-coded limit, like you have to be 25 degrees on this part. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Then, I would have to say, Katja, thank you very much for coming in on short notice. I think you presented the work very, very well. The work in itself is very exciting, and we'd like, hopefully, to work more with you and, and Flo. So, please. Help me by saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Our next speaker is Klaus Zimke. Klaus, you come in. There we are. Wonderful. Good. Now, Klaus has studied aerospace engineering at the University of Stuttgart, and there he was also involved in the flying laptop. He's worked uh, at STEC. And he's actually in his spare time, this is what I found very interesting, is the amount of work that he's been doing for the uh, open source. He's been working on a framework called Open Sim Kit. He's uh, going to be sharing with us a project called The Third Eye. Please welcome <laughs> Klaus. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a weird name, eh? but the, the, the rationale behind it is uh, that uh, with the third eye you can see things that are not real. So it's, it's a simulation uh, environment. Um, yes, so I think I will, I will continue a little bit uh, uh, the talk about uh, systems engineering requirements. So uh, yeah, I have a generic picture about uh, the usual system engineering process. Uh, the typical V model we tend to follow in the in the uh, space domain, and then yeah, uh, Katya was just speaking about uh, requirements engineering. Uh, for me, it's uh, it's the most important point about requirement engineering is to capture the needs of the of the customer actually what what the customer wants uh, you to to build. Uh, then from the requirements, you are transforming your requirements into a system design. Um, with some sort of uh, analysis and some uh, engineering best practices. From that, you are uh, implementing the specified design. If anybody has some nice stock images on implementation and verification, please let me know. I don't find anything. Um, and then, up actually, you are verifying in the end uh, that the system you implemented is actually compliant to the to the requirement. Uh, I sadly, I'm I'm living in a world where it's, it's it's not possible to change to change the requirements to make it fit the system you build, so you have to do it the other way around. So uh, now how can we build all this uh, uh, in, a, in a typical open source project? And as many of you might know, a typical open source project is one guy doing nothing. So, uh, and I'm only one guy, so how can I do that all that in my free time? It's very simple. You have to be the little kid on top, yeah? And you have to wear a helmet, because it's quite dangerous on, on the top. So we are standing on the shoulders of uh, giants. We are using uh, Java as a, as a base foundation. All the, all the tools I'm talking about are implemented in Java. Uh, we have a Eclipse. I think uh, most of you sh uh, would be uh, familiar with this. It's an open source uh, uh, framework, basically, Java framework. Um, then on top of that, we have the Eclipse, Eclipse modeling uh, framework. It's a framework for model-based software engineering. It's, uh, Basically, you are specifying your software in a UML-like way, and you are generating your, your Java source code from that. We have Sirius, which is a tool on top of uh, 
Eclipse the EMF a modeling framework, which is generating uh, fancy graphical editors for your for your EMF models. We have Papyrus, which is uh, uh, also EMF-based uh, UML modeling tool, so you can do all your UML modeling directly in uh, Eclipse. We have ProR, which is an EMF-based uh, requirements engineering uh, tool. It's a little bit like uh, DOORS, not, not so fancy, of course, as DOORS is, but uh, you can basically use it as a, as a stand-in replacement for DOORS if you don't need to have the change tracking in of your requirements. Change tracking ProR cannot do. And we have Gendoc, which is an EMF documentation generator, so it can generate documentation from EMF models. And we have NASA Worldwide. Uh, it's a Java-based uh, uh, rendering uh, visualization application developed by NASA. So, typical use case uh, or use case for the simulator is a typical task in the CubeSat development is uh, uh, solar array sizing. Obviously, this is not a CubeSat, and the sun is also not to scale. But uh, I think the image is uh, is, is uh, commu uh, c uh, communicating what I want to say is you have to calculate how much energy your, your solar arrays will generate, uh, depending on how large they are, how efficient they are, and what your attitude of your uh, spacecraft is, what your orbit is, and so on and so forth. So here uh, is a uh, quick overview about the requirements uh, modeled in, uh, in this ProR tool. It's uh, just the requirements, very, very top-level requirements for the, for the uh, few models I have specified for this, for this uh, uh, task. So there's a sun model, there's a solar cell model, and a solar flux connection model. They have various inputs and outputs, and they have some calculation logic, which is captured here in the, in the requirements tool. From that, I derive my uh, model design for the, for the simulation. So as you see, it's actually quite easy. It's just a UML-like class diagram where you can define your attributes and properties of your, uh, of your models, and you can uh, specify the, the calc functions, so to say. From that, you auto-generate your implementation, and this is just a little uh, comeback to the uh, colleague yesterday talking about uh, overhead and the verbosity of Java. But uh, what you see here is the auto-generated code, and actually the only little the piece here, down here, the orange one, is the one I have uh, implemented by hand. So actually, that's only the code you have to maintain. You have uh, 580 lines of code in the class, but you have 20 lines of code that you actually have to maintain. So uh, then uh, running all your models is, uh, here is a nice screenshot of the simulation. Um, you see the system. This uh, boxes here, which are looking a little bit like Simulink, are uh, the, the serious generated uh, visualization of the, of the model. Here you have the outline of the system again in a textual representation. It's basically the same as here. Um, after you have run your, your simulation, which has a a gravity model, a point mass model, uh, attitude model, solar array model, and then the sun providing some solar flux to the solar array. Um, you can visualize uh, 3D the, the orbit, for example, and you can also plot uh, in a 2D way. For example, this is the power the solar array would be generating if it would be 0 0.1 square meters and have an efficiency of 30 degrees, uh, 30 percent. And there you can see the, actually, as you see, it's it's not a CubeSat, it's a Borg, Borg invading cube, I think. Uh, it's just a little bit out of scale so that you can actually see it. Then afterwards, you can use your document generator to, to, to uh, generate some uh, very ugly uh, open, uh, open uh, LibreOffice uh, documents for the requirements. But if you are putting a little bit more work than me into the template, actually, you can make it much, much prettier. This is just an example. So, coming already to the conclusion, we, and uh, by saying we, I mean I, have developed a simulator kernel, but we s s sounds much better. <laughs> <laughs> we have developed a simulator kernel that uh, allows you to rapidly develop models, because you are we are using the modeling framework and you have to do actually very little work to, to build some models. It is, uh, I think, actually quite easy to use. Um, if I explain you how to do it, because it's no documentation avail available yet. Uh, it's in tightly integrated into the Eclipse, Eclipse ecosystem, which is quite nice, because you are getting all these bonus tools uh, from the Eclipse project for free. Free as in free beer and free speech. Um, it provides already some plotting and visualization. 
it saves all the results of your run uh, uh, on the on the hard disk, so you can later uh, examine uh, uh, all your all your data. And it also provides a central integrator. That means that uh, if you are having some uh, derivatives and some uh, differential equations in your models, you only have to calculate the, the differentials. The integration is done automatically by the by the framework. Some outlook. The next thing, or one of the bigger tasks I want to do is I want to integrate the QEMU and System C into the simulator. I've already done that for uh, for uh, for an older uh, 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 simulation project, so that we can have a software verification facility that you can have your onboard software running in your uh, simulated environment, and you can uh, verify your onboard software directly. And second uh, task is uh, I have already a working prototype. Is uh, I want to uh, not store the, the results in the on the disk, but on a, in a, in a uh, NoSQL database, together with the requirements and the UML artifacts that you are generating, so that you can do some big data uh, for systems engineering. You can actually train your uh, your uh, your your AI. I think you are were talking about uh, for for. Uh, for your needs uh, for the on the on the big data you have in your in your database. Obviously, I have to uh, develop more models. I want to have uh, more uh, different integrators, uh, some better document generation, which is a little bit prettier than uh, little features like models inside models inside models and so forth. Modeling data buses and of course, big topic always the documentation. And last uh, but not least, or not uh, second second to last, but uh, still not least, uh, the call for participation. Everything is better with users, so it's uh, much better to have uh, to to develop something if you are if you if actually get some user needs, what they what the people would like to to have as a feature in the in the in the kernel. So uh, if you want to try it out, please contact me at my email address. Uh, because right now the code is not yet publicly available. It's already checked on uh, in GitLab, but as a private project right now, because I still have to uh, check out like one or two or three lines of code for, for the IP, uh, because I have some external contributions which I have to check whether I can release it or not. But it will soon be released, hopefully in 2017, so very soon be uh, publicly available under the Eclipse public license. And uh, uh, acknowledgement, I would uh, like to acknowledge my employer, DLR. Uh, this is a private project in my spare time, as I said, but they are sponsoring still, they are sponsoring my trip here. I want to acknowledge also Alexander Brandt, who is contributing some models for the, for the talk, and of course the organizers for the great uh, event today. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Questions? We have one here. Thank you, Papa. And then Helga next. Um, did you say or do you think that uh, Sirius could be an alternative to Simulink? No. <laughs> Very simple because the, the aim of Sirius is not, uh, is, is Sirius is only a visualization tool. It has no functionality as itself. So uh, basically what I do is uh, I use Sirius to turn this EMF models which I have here automatically into some pres presentation like this. This is the only thing that Sirius is doing. So Sirius is to my tool what Simulink is to MATLAB, so to say a little bit. Uh, it's, it's, it's a visualization on top, but it has no calculation of functionality in itself. But yes, you can use Sirius very nicely to build a tool which could replace Simulink. Thank you. Helga? Um, you're, you're probably familiar with the SMP2 standard, right? Yes. And you're, uh, you, you probably also know that this is becoming a, an ECSS standard now, like ECSS yes. SMP. Um, do you plan your tool to be compatible with that? or No. What is SMP? SMP2, I can explain quickly. SMP2 is a, syst uh, si uh, syst a simulation model portability center. It's a very nice uh, ESA concept that uh, one thing fits all. And uh, so, so, so the the that's my point of of criticism, or what why I'm not do not doing SMP2 is because it's very complex. 
to do something which can fit all needs. And uh, I'm trying only to fit my own need, which is quite simple actually. And I like to keep the thing simple. So you, as, as I have shown, the only thing you have to do to, 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 to build a model uh, is capable of running in my simulator is you have to inherit from one class. And okay, you cannot see it here. You have to EMF annotate these things and that's it. So if you would try to make a SMP2 a compliant model, you would have to do much more. So I don't think for me it makes sense to, I was thinking about it, but it's, it's, it's too complicated, quite frankly. Thank you. I Tom? Just uh, a comment and answer to Boris. Boris, if you need Simulink-like tool, try XCOS. Uh, and I have a suggestion, uh, maybe as an output of this meeting. Could we put together an array of software uh, that is open software uh, that applies to different areas? So then we would know where to use it, what's the archive, and so on. Yeah, very good point. I'm sure we can do that. Good. Is Arto going to answer that now? Oh, I love this presentation. It's uh, yeah. exactly uh, the topic of my interest, in, uh, in fact one of the topics of my interest. And um, I just wonder who in the audience is familiar with model-based system engineering because that's what it is, yeah? So please raise your hand. Okay, for all the others, you're missing out the future because this is what's going to happen. So we are going away from this document-centric view of a system where you write down, where you basically explain in a document what your system is all about towards a model-based um, a view, so where you have a central repository that holds all your data and the truth, requirements, design, and so on. And from this, you generate documents if you need them. And these documents will then be, the content of this will be consistent with what is in your model. Yes, the documents will only serve to terrorize ESA <laughs> because they have to review them. Exactly. So, so you click a button, you generate the documents, and then yes. the management is happy. <laughs> and you don't have to do much about it. So um, there was one question. If we have time, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Just one more question. Uh, are you using UML or SysML? Because in this uh, right now, neither. <laughs> I'm I'm using EMF. Okay. Which is a subset of, sort of a subset of UML. One more question, please. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in model-based systems engineering, we had this working group yesterday. Um, there were a lot of interesting discussions. Um, on, on the topic of, uh, of your presentation, I was just curious, how extensible or pluggable is your software architecture? Um, Very. Okay, so it's easy to write a plugin, to write uh, things that kind of plug into the existing architecture as it is. And do you have any such examples of people who've written plugins or things that are in the works? Uh, okay, to extend the I find it quite easy. I don't know if you might. <laughs> Because, as I said, it's right now, it's, it's, it's basically I put all my effort into making it work and not making it, or not documenting it. But uh, I think it's the architecture is built in a way that is actually quite extensible. Uh, I have uh, used uh, all the software engineering best practices to have, uh, to have uh, uh, replaceable submodules. So you can, uh, one example, for example, is the integrators. You could easily write your own integrator and, uh, and plug it in. You could also easily write in your own sequence, so the sequence uh, when uh, when what when wh when which model is executed, the functionality. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's quite extensible, and also you are again you are in the Eclipse ecosystem, so you have a plugin system of Eclipse. So you can you can use that. Yes, so I think it's quite extensible. I hope. Thank you. And to finish, just to answer you, Thomas, this morning I shared this link. There is a GitLab link where we can start. Uh, sharing uh, all this information, and we'll discuss with uh, LSF about this. Okay. Thank you. I would like to say thank you very much to class. Thank you for letting me here. Very good. It's now time for our break. We will be returning here for the next session of talks at 11 o'clock. If you go quickly to the cafeteria, there is still uh, uh, a chance to buy things until 11, then they close it. So if you're actually hungry, there's actually sandwiches over there, and you can um, do that before 11. Uh, we have uh, really refreshments here too, is remember, but please come back just before 11 so you can take your seats ready to start on time. Thank you very much for this morning. Yeah. <laughs>